Okay. So, welcome back. So, what we have been doing, we have been focusing on proving the central limit theorem. I talked about the statement of central limit theorem in depth, its interpretations. It's just a miracle that you take some bunch of random variables, no matter what their distributions are. If you sum them up, their sum is going to behave like the normal distribution actually. Okay, So that's what, um, what do you call the central limit theorem essentially says. And this theorem kind of leads to uh, a good amount of applications. Uh, this theorem is one of the, what do you call, the theorem that is at the heart of the probability theory and that's what makes probability theory applicable to a wide variety of practical areas actually. So let's quickly <coughs> review again the uh, what you call statement of central limit theorem. Okay, we're gonna write a more better version of the central limit theorem as well soon, but we're gonna prove this first. So imagine you have a sequence of IIDs. So you have sequence of random variables that are independent and identically distributed. They are independent and all these random variables have the same distribution with mean mu and variance xi. And when I'm saying that identically distribution, what I mean that the, all of these random variables have follow a same distribution. So in other words, all of these are binomial or all of these are what do you call uh, multinomial, or all of these are hypergeometric, or all of these are what do you call um, uh, say geometric and so on and so forth. So they all are uh, uh, of the same distribution with the same expectation and variance. So you have a such sequence of random variable and SN, <coughs> SN is the standardized version of the sum of the first n uh, random variables. So so if you take the first n terms of this random variable and sum them up, then the expectation of this sum is going to be the sum of expectation, which is same as like summing up the number mu n times, and this is going to make n new. And you take, for example, the variance of, say, the n terms of uh, uh, this sequence. So this is going to be the equal to the sum of variances minus twice of the covariances but since these are independent the covariances are going to be zero. So the sum of variances is going to be uh, the sum of the sigma square because all of these random variables have the same variance so is going to make it n sigma square actually. <coughs> so, so n nu is the mean of the sum and uh, 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 n sigma square is the variance of the sum actually. Now, Sn is this sum of random variable minus its mean divided by the standard deviation actually. Okay? The standard deviation. And I have given, given this, uh, what do you call, um, uh, standardized sum a name Sn. So what does central limit say? Central limit says that this standardized sum of the random variables okay, would converge to a random variable, uh, to the standard normal random variable as n goes to infinity. In fact, what you can say also, I mean, you can also deduce from it that the sum of these random variables okay, uh, will converge to a normally distributed random variable with mean mu and sigma square actually. Okay, but if you standardize it, it will converge to the standard normal random variable as n goes to infinity in distribution. <coughs> now what is the meaning of convergence of this standardized sum to the standard normal random variable in distribution as n goes to infinity? The meaning of it is there is precisely that if you consider the distribution function of this standardized sum, okay, that this distribution function will converge to the distribution function of the standard normal random variable as n goes to infinity. So this is what the meaning of distribution is. So when I'm saying that a sequence xn converges to x in distribution, what do I actually mean? Okay, that the CDF of uh, what do you call 
uh, the sequence converges to the CDF of uh, the random variable x. So that's what is the definition of the convergence in. <coughs> okay. So um, uh, what do you call the outline of it is that if you consider the sum of random variables, the sum of random variables, no matter what distribution they have, the sum will always converge to normal distribution. And that's what makes it, you know, miracle. Uh, makes it a miracle actually that you don't know about the distributions of the random variable but you know that their sum okay if that sum gets bigger and bigger will will be always be will always have a normal distribution actually okay that's what it says and then we also talked about a lemma the method through which we can approve what do you call uh, this central limit theorem so this lemma says that consider you have a sequence of IIDs, independent random variables, and say, uh, and, and a random variable V. So if, if the moment generating function of this sequence converges to the moment generating function of Z, then the distribution function of the sequence will converge to the distribution function of Z. So in order to prove that the distribution function of a sequence converges to a distribution function of a particular random variable, it is enough to show the moment generating function of the sequence converges to the moment generating function of what do you call uh, the random variable, okay, the limit actually. So in order to show this, <coughs> so in order to show this, to show or prove the central limit theorem, if if this lemma is true, then it is sufficient to show that the moment generating function of Sn of t converges to what you call the moment generating function of a standard normal random variable, which we know actually that it's t equal to t squared upon 2 as, as n goes to infinity. Okay? So if we can prove this, okay, if we can prove this we will be done with the proof of the central limit theorem because this will imply through this lemma that the distribution function of the standardized sum converges to the standard uh, distribution function of a standard normal random variable actually. So this is what that <coughs> we are interested in proving. So we'll take a humble start. We will first prove this statement for the a case when the random variable, all of these random variables have mean zero and variance, what do you call, uh, uh, one actually, okay, for all i equal to one, two, three, and so on and so forth, okay. So first, we will prove this statement, okay, this statement for the case when all of these random variables have mean zero and variance, what do you call one actually. And using this case, we will prove the general case as well actually. Okay. <coughs> so in this case, what would be Sn? So if expectation of Xi is zero and the variance of Xi is zero, in other words, mu is zero and sigma is zero, the Sn is going to be the sum of xi that goes from say 1 to n and divided by the square root of n actually because this mu will be 0 and sigma will be 1 actually. And I want to show, I want to show that this sequence converges in distribution uh, to the, what do you call, the, the standard, uh, the distribution function of a standard normal random variable actually. That is, <coughs> as n goes to infinity. That is, that if you compute the moment generating function of this standardized sum, um, the moment generating function of this standardized sum, maybe the distribution function of this standardized sum, this will convert to the distribution function of the standard normal random variable actually, as n goes to infinity. Okay? And again, as by this lemma, it is sufficient to show that the moment generating function of Sn converges to the moment generating function of Z actually. So I hope you got <coughs> this strategy. So let's just start with 
computing the moment generating function of Sn. Now, the definition of the moment generating function is that, that the moment generating function is expectation of p multiplied by that random variable actually. Now, if I substitute this value, you're going to get the expectation of the t times sum that goes from i equal to 1 to n xi. <coughs> Uh, divided by scale root of n, okay, e at. So this is this is what that you're gonna get. I can uh, this sum is on i. So if I wish, I can pull this scale root of t outside, then I, scale root of n outside, and I can write this as t over scale root of n and sum of x i is actually. <coughs> now I can write this sum separately. So I can write this as uh, this expectation as expectation of t over the square root of n x1 times e to the t over the square root of n x2 times e to the t over the square root of n x x. This is what it's going to be. Now, what do I know about um, the uh, what do I know about these random variables xi if that they are all, 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 uh, they are independent actually. And if they are independent, so these are the functions of x1, x2, xt. So this is the function of x1, this is the function of x2, this is the function of xn. So these are continuous functions. Then we know that if x and y are independent, they are continuous functions, okay, are also independent. Okay, so we, we proved that if x and y are independent, okay, previously, then, you know, f of x, any function of x and g of y are also independent, actually. That is, that if you compute the expectation of the, uh, 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 expectation of the product, it should be same as the product of the expectations, actually. This is about the two. Okay. <coughs> now, now applying this result here, so what are you going to get? So I can say that this would be same as the expectation of p e over the square root of n x1 times the expectation of e to the t over the square root of n x2 up to the expectation of e to the t over the square root of n x n actually. This is what that you're going to get. Which is same as computing the moment generating function of x1 at t over the square root of n times computing the moment generating function of x2 at t over the square root of n times computing the moment generating function of xn at t over the square root of n actually. This is what is going to <coughs> now, since all of these random variables have, they are identically distributed and have same mean and variance, which is, you know, in the first case we have taken them to be 0 and 1, okay. So, their moment generating functions are also going to be equal actually, okay. Their moment generating functions are also, all, 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 they are also going to be equal. In other words, moment generating function mxi of t would be same as mxj of t for all i and j. Okay, this is what it is going to be. <coughs> and look, let's call these all expectations as m of t. Okay, so if if these are equal for all i and j. In other words, m1 is equal to m2, m1 is equal to m3, m2 and m3, they, they all are equal. So let's give all of these moment generation function a common value, say m of t. So if this is the case, then I can say that, okay, what is this moment generating function? It is m of t. What is this moment generating function? It is m of t. Up to all moment generating function gives m of t. So therefore, you're going to get m of t what you call power n. 
so what did we shown by doing the calculation we showed the moment generating function of Sn of t is equal to the common moment generating function power n actually. Okay. So call this equation number so you call it star. <coughs> Let me introduce a function. almost done. Let me introduce a function that that is a uh, no, sorry this is not going to be m of t but since these are evaluated at t over square root of n so all of these are also going to be t over square root of n t over square root of n and p over s of n. Okay. This is what it is I'm going to be done like it. More explicitly that this is going to be the m of t over s square root of n power n. <coughs> okay. What is the next thing? The next thing is really to show that if you take the limit m of t over s square root of n goes to, uh, if, if you take the limit of this side, this side converges to what you call um, uh, e to the t scale over 2 actually, okay, e to the t scale over 2 which is really the moment generating function of a standard normal random variable, okay. <coughs> so what would we like to show, we would like to show that this m s n of t which is m of t okay so let me let me write it first and then you know come back to it so so let's so set say a function l of t which is say log of m of t okay taking the log of <coughs> m of t. Now uh, I'm going to play with it and I'm going to deduce my required result. So let's consider for this log some derivatives. Okay, what would be L of zero? So it's going to be log of m of zero. Now m of zero or m of t is expectation of what do you call e to the uh, some random variable x. So if you're going to substitute to 0, m of 0 is always expectation of e to the 0 and expectation of e to the 0 is expectation of 1 which is equal to 1 actually. So the m of 0 is always 1. So the log, this would be log of 1 which is 0. So the L evaluated at 0 is equal to 1. <laughs> Let's compute the first order derivative of it because this is what that we will need later on in our calculation. So the first order derivative of it is going to be 1 over m of t times m prime of t. So if you want to compute say l prime of 0, okay, this is going to be m prime of 0 over m of 0 actually. Okay. This is what that you're going to get. Now, we just saw that m of 0 is 0. But what is m prime of 0? We know that m prime of 0 is expectation. Okay? By since it's a moment generating function, so its first derivative evaluated at 0 is equal to the expectation. But this expectation for now we have assumed 0 because we are first doing the case when this mu is 0 and sigma square is 1. <coughs> so, <coughs> I can say, oh sorry, this is 1 actually, not 0. M of 0 is the expectation of e to the 0, which is expectation of 1 and f. So, so this means this will become 0 upon 1 and L prime of 0 will be 0 as well. Okay? Now if I compute, for example, a second order derivative, of this, 
you what you're gonna get. You can have a, um, what do you call uh, the uh, product rule. So you can have a um, double prime of t times um, m of t minus m prime of t times m prime of t and everything divided by m of t squared. <coughs> this is what that you're going to get. So u prime v minus u v prime divided by m of t0 squared. So if I compute this at 0, so what you're going to get? You're going to get m double prime of 0, m of 0 minus m prime of 0 square okay, divided by m of 0 square. Okay, this is what that you're going to get. <coughs> now, <coughs> let's substitute the zero the value. m double prime of 0 is expectation of x square actually. Okay? This is expectation of x square. Now, I know, okay, that if a random variable, what is the variance of random variable? So, variance of a random variable is expectation of x square minus expectation of x whole square. Okay, this is what the variance of the random variable is. Now, expectation of all these random variables are z is 0 and variance is equal to 1. So what are going to say that expectation of x square is equal to expectation of x square is going to be equal to 1 actually. So shall I write it a bit more explicitly? <coughs> okay, so, so here is the case. I know that m double prime of 0 is expectation of what do you call because this m is the uh, moment generating function of any random variable. So let's say that this is expectation of x1 square. But expectation of x1 square is equal to the variance of x1 square actually. Why? Because variance of x1 square is expectation of x1 square minus expectation of x1 whole square. And what you what do you have assumed about the expectation of x1 that this is equal to zero? So this term would be zero, and hence all these these two are equal actually. So what does this show? That the variance of x uh, variance of x1 is expectation of x1 squared. Okay, and uh, if the uh, expectation of x1 squared is variance of x1 squared, we know about the variance of x1. We have assumed it. We have assumed mu to be 0 and sigma squared to be 1, so this would be equal to 1. So what does this show? That m double prime of 0 is 1. So now if I substitute the values, because I know the rest of the values, so it's going to be 1 time m of 0, which is 1, minus m prime of 0, which is 0, divided by m square of 0, which is 1 squared, so this is equal to 1 actually. <coughs> so the L double prime of 0 is equal to 1. This is what that we would like to show. Okay. Now, why I did all these calculations? The reason is this. If I want to show, if I want to show that this m of t power n t the square root of n power n converges to e to the t square over 2. Okay? e to the t square over 2. Then it is equivalent to show that the log of m of t square root or n converges to the log of e to the t square over 2 which is t square over 2. But the log of m of t over n is really L of t over n, square root of n. Okay? So, let me say it precisely again. 
So if I take log on the both sides of the limit, I'm going to get n, m, uh, n log m of t over the square root of n converges to the, what do you call t square root of But this is same as n l of t over the square root of n. <coughs> so, as n goes to infinity, okay. as n goes to infinity. Now, if I can show that n multiplied by L over T over M, this function converges to you know, T square over 2, then exponential of the both sides, so in other words, M of T over N, power N will converge to the E to the T square over 2. So if this converges to T square over 2, taking exponential both sides, would give me what? So, the, so you're going to have e to the log m or t square root of uh, log t or the square root of n converged to e to the t square root of 2 after. Okay? So in other words, in order to show this, it is sufficient to show this actually. So if you can show that n multiplied by L of t over n converges to t square over 10, t square over 2, then this will prove that m of t over n, t divided by square root of n power n converges to e to the t square over 2. Okay? <coughs> so this is this is going to be true actually if this is true. So let's let's show this limit actually. Let's show this limit. Okay. Let's show this limit. This is what that I'm gonna show. Uh, I'm gonna keep these three facts in front of me, L of 0 is 0, L prime of 0 is 0, L double prime of 1 is equal to 1. Okay? So let's show this limit. <coughs> let's show this limit. So let's compute limit n goes to infinity n l of the t over the square root of n. This is what that we would like to compute. Now I can write this as l of, so if I for example substitute the square root of n, this would be an indeterminate form. So in order to compute this limit, n goes to infinity, l t over the square root of n, I can play a trick that I can put n here. <coughs> now this would be a kind of infinity by infinity form actually, <coughs> a 0 by 0 form. So this would be a kind of a 0 by 0 form because this would become L of 0 which is 0, 1 over n will go to 0 so this is 0 by 0 form. So I can apply the L'Hopital rule here. So if I apply the L'Hopital rule here, I'm going to get what? I'm going to get limit n goes to infinity L prime of t over the square root of n multiplied by the derivative of n power minus 1 upon 2 okay, divided by uh, the derivative minus of 1 over n which is going to be minus 1 over n square. <coughs> what would be the derivative of uh, n power minus 1 upon 2 with respect to n? So it is going to be negative one half and n power minus three half actually. Negative one half and n power minus <coughs> three half. And if you simplify it a bit more, let's keep one.